For me, Into the Spider-Verse was one of those weird little movies that kinda came out of nowhere way back in 2018, an animated feature film about a character I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about that ended up being way smarter, more inventive, better written and emotionally engaging than 90% of the live action movies being squirted out these days. In short, it was a film that made me pretty happy and I was interested to see where they'd go with the inevitable sequel. I mean, I never expected it to take 5 years but what what the hell? It's 2023 and here we are, staring down the barrel of Across the Spider-Verse. A title that definitely won't lead to confusion when I start comparing them on open bar after half a bottle of cheap whiskey. Anyway, enough of my pish. You're here to find out if this film's a worthy follow-up to the original, if it was worth the five-year wait, and most importantly of all, if it's worth parting with half of your monthly wage just to go and see it at the cinema. Seriously, why are tickets so fucking expensive now? I could buy a special session with Tatiana for the cost of your average film, and I know which one I'd rather spend my money on. <laughs> anyway, I'm happy to say that the answer to all of these questions is yes. It's not exactly a resounding yes, and there's a few caveats that I'll go into in a minute, but overall, Across the Spider-Verse is a fun, colourful, imaginative and heartfelt movie with some great character beats, decent gags and snappy dialogue, gorgeous animation that makes the most out of its comic book origins, a plot that does more with its multi concept than Marvel ever did, and a cliffhanger ending that neatly sets us up for part 2. On the other hand, the 140 minute runtime feels kinda bloated and sluggish compared to the original, character arcs and plot points get repeated multiple times without adding anything particularly new, and the excessive focus on supporting characters at the expense of the protagonist starts to grate after a while. I mean, none of these issues are enough to derail the movie, but they do hold it back and prevent it from reaching the same heights as its predecessor. Anyway, strap on your gender-neutral web-slinging gear and let's talk about the plot, shall we? The film picks up about a year after the events of the first movie, with Gwen Stacy struggling to fight crime as Spider-Woman while keeping her identity hidden from her father. Anyway, she gets into a tangle with a villain from a different reality and ends up getting bailed out by Miguel O'Hara and Jessica Drew, basically alternate versions of herself from different universes who end up recruiting her into a secret organisation designed to protect the multiverse, or spider Verse, if you will. Back in his own dimension, Miles Morales is struggling with much the same problems as Gwen until he ends up running into a brand new villain named Spot, a mad scientist out for revenge after Miles accidentally turned him into a walking portal gun at the end of the last movie. Now he's got the power to travel into different universes and plans to make himself even stronger along the way so that he can take everything that Miles took from him. Not good news. Needless to say though, Miles eventually hooks up with Gwen and the other spider people to track down spot together, but when he finds out the true nature of the organisation and the common threads that bind them all together, will he really want to side with them? And is there a way to change his fate, or is he destined to be like all the other Spider-Men in the multiverse? Now, I've got to admit, after the ridiculous bloated shit show of Doctor Strange 2 and Loki, I was pretty soured on the whole concept of multiverses and alternate realities. Partly because stuff like that is so incomprehensively huge that it becomes difficult for the human mind to even grasp what's at stake, but mostly because it was all handled so terribly. But to its credit, Across the Spider-Verse actually does a pretty good job putting all these grand ideas into context and grounding them in actual human drama with characters the audience cares about. It's crazy, I know, but it's amazing how much more compelling a story becomes when it's happening to people that you're actually invested in. Based on my limited understanding, Miles Morales is kind of a contentious character in comic book circles, but since I know precisely fuck all about that world, all I can really do is judge him as he's presented right here. And again, I think the script does a good job of fleshing him out as a distinct and separate entity from Peter Parker. Apart from sharing some of the same powers and basic personal situation, I never got the sense that he was just a tokenized carbon copy of a more popular character. And to be fair, the movie provides a pretty compelling explanation for why he's a bit different from every other Spider-Man out there. An explanation that'll definitely have big implications on the next movie. Gwen Stacy comes across as likeable and good-natured and a decent foil for Miles. She's not some overpowered Mary Sue who can do everything better than him because feminism. She's just another variant of the Spider-Man identity, struggling with her own problems back in her own reality. And yeah, you could probably make the argument that she's given a bit too much screen time for a supporting character, but if my suspicions about the next movie are correct, there's a very good reason why they want the audience to get invested in her. 
I mean, it's not all perfect on the character front. I mentioned before that the cast is probably bigger than it needs to be, and Jessica Drew is a prime example of this. She doesn't really add anything to the story and just eats up screen time in an already bloated movie. Also, having a heavily pregnant woman trying to ride a motorbike and do action sequences is never gonna not look fucking ridiculous. Also, I can't shake the feeling that the script is doing everything in its power to play down Peter Parker, like it's afraid the audience will somehow start rooting for him over Miles if he's shown to be too capable and confident. The first movie portrayed him as an aging, burned out loser who only redeems himself at the end, while the second film morphs him into a bumbling, hapless father in a pink bathrobe who for some reason keeps taking his baby along on life-threatening adventures despite having a perfectly capable mother at home to look after it. Is this some weird attempt to mock and belittle the Spider-Man that most people know and love, who incidentally just happens to be the only straight white man in the entire movie? I don't know man, it just kinda leaves a sour taste in my mouth, that's all. The scenes between Miles and his parents mirror the relationship between Gwen and her father, both characters struggling with the secrets they're keeping from the people they love the most. And while they're both well done, Gwen's arc feels a lot more brisk and efficient, showing us exactly what we need to see and no more. Miles' scenes on the other hand feel self-indulgent and redundant. There's a lot of repetition and recycling of the same basic conversations and well, it starts to get a bit tedious after a while. From a visual point of view, the movie is absolutely fantastic using a pretty striking animation style that reminded me of Arcane at times. Each new location in the Spider-Verse has got a different art style, so there's always some interesting new twist on the design. Character models are expressive and filled with personality and emotion, and their movements and gestures look like they were motion captured, they're that accurate. On the downside though, there's times when there's so much shit getting thrown at you that it becomes almost overwhelming. Basically, if you suffer from photosensitive epilepsy, this really isn't the movie for you. Across the Spider-Verse is the first half of a two-part story, and so clearly a lot of the focus is on setting up stuff for future payoffs. The obvious disadvantage is that the movie lacks any resolutions and sometimes feels artificially padded, and I can't shake the feeling that all they did here was take one really compelling story and stretch it out into two movies instead of one. I mean, that's not to say that a lot of love and care didn't go into this one, there's plenty of good stuff in it, there's a ton of references and in-jokes that only the most dedicated Spider-Man fans are gonna get, and a neat little twist at the end that most people will probably see coming but felt pretty satisfying all the same. And if I'm right, then the sequel should have some pretty hard-hitting resolutions to the big questions posed by this film. And weirdly enough, I actually trust the writers not to fuck it up for once. Ultimately, although it doesn't quite reach the same heights as its predecessor, Across the Spider-Verse is still a pretty fucking good movie overall, and way better than anything that Marvel have managed to shart out in recent years. And as long as the final chapter doesn't drop the ball, I think Miles Morales might just end up with a legacy to be proud of with this trilogy. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.